so yeah honestly it's it's so easy to do a meta analysis and it's the problem is really not the problem is really not doing the analysis but getting the data you want so what are you going to need to do your meta analysis and this is a real one this is real data from my real my real career i'll explain the data in a bit so you need a, a text file or something similar i just use a text file to load into gemov or jasp and the real data are if you want the if you want the actual data you can just that that's the data so you can copy you can copy and paste that uh, that text file if you want if you go on my web page you can just get that so you need an effect size in the first column for example it doesn't matter which columns but it's easier to put it in the first one so an effect size is cohen's d and in this case a positive is better performance and negative is worse performance and then a standard error you, you might notice that a lot of these numbers are the same so the standard error here is lots of 0 0.289 302 so they're all the same number and that's because this is a cohen's d because the sample size of these studies is all very similar the standard error is going to be very similar as well so 289 is when there were 12 subjects in the experiment there we are i think 302 was 11 subjects or 10 not sure 408 was probably nine and then two, 258 that was probably that was the last one that was 15. so in this case not all, it's not always like this but in this case because i've converted them to cohen's d the, the standard error is basically a simple function of the, uh, the number of subjects. Uh, that's just a label for the, the data that I was collecting and then a covariate at the end. But all, all you need to do in meta-analysis is these two columns, an effect size, a standard error of that effect size, and uh, a label to help you interpret it. So that's, um, I think, 12 different studies of three different kinds. Okay, so now I'm just going to open JASP on my machine. There it is. So if you prefer to use Jamovi, it's almost identical. I used to use SPSS when I was trained, and that is, it's terrible. JASP is a free, friendly, flexible way to do statistics. And Jamovi is identical, just with a slightly different different uh, interface, I think. Right, so I'm, I've just loaded in my data. So I've got, uh, sorry, I've slightly differently organized from what I just showed you, but it's the same data. So I've got a study label, oops, a standardized mean difference, or Cohen's D, a standard error, and then I've got a another variable type which I might use in a bit. Then you can do all these uh, stats. We're going to do a meta-analysis. Um, because this is introduction to meta-analysis, and also because I know nothing else about any of these, so I know nothing about all eight of these, and I only know about this one, that's what we're going to do. Uh, if, you want, if you want to know about all those other eight ones, um, you're going to need a different masterclass, I'm afraid, and I'm unlikely to do it either because I'm very much old traditional st statistical theory person. So it's like any other easy stats software. You just point and shoot. So you tick your, put my study labels in there, put my standardized mean difference is my effect size. The standard error is my effect size standard error. The wheels of death rotate. And then you have your results on the, and that's it. That's it, that's all done. So we spent six hours to do five seconds of processing in JASP. So what this is, is uh, these are the, the basic results. I've done nothing nothing fancy at all here. And then you get these stats output like you would in any software. So the main the main thing, the main result, it's not obvious when you look at this, what, what is the result of my meta-analysis, but it's it's here. And I love that it's uh, 666. So if you look at these numbers, the average number across all those is minus 0.666. So two thirds. So that's my effect size. That's my meta-analysis meta Cohen's D effect size, 666. And then the standard error for that is 0 0.094. So if you divide 666 by 0 0.094, you get 7077. Let's just, let's just check that's true. Phew, that was lucky. Uh, so in case you've ever looked at these boxes and wondered how we get these numbers, you just take your estimate divide it by your standard error and you get in this case a z score or a, so it's the number of standard errors away from zero it's a bit like a t score it all just depends t or z or um, d depends on the test you're doing it's slightly different 7077 versus 7085 because presumably there's some extra decimal places in there which i've not included so that's my cohen's d effect size 666 across all 12 studies and that is my standard error and you can see that's very healthy looking z score and p value so i know that on average my studies are significantly negative so on average all my 12 studies produce a negative effect so that's the main result that you're looking for and then the other results are about uh, one is about i'm not sure i'm not sure whether 
I guess that's uh, whether the model as a whole is predicting the variability between the, the lines of the data. The heterogeneity is asking whether these 12 studies are similar to each other or very different, and it's not significant, so it suggests they're, they're not different from each other. So it's the 12 studies are similar. Um, that should make sense because all these 12 studies have come from my lab and they're with very, very similar um, experimental designs, for example. So that's good. That's a good positive tick for me in my labs, just we're doing the same thing 12 times. Down here, you probably have to Google what these things mean, but they're about heterogeneity again. So when you say there was no significant heterogeneity, you can quote these numbers and you can probably look up what they mean. I think, yeah, I don't, I don't know how much to interpret those, but you can look up those and try and work out what they mean. And that's the basic analysis. Um, you can play with the boxes, of course. Um, let's not do that one. Let's do some of this. So here's some of the things we've been talking about. Um, let's add some confidence intervals to those estimates. So that will add, so we've got our estimate and our standard error, and we've now got confidence intervals. So, so the middle should be 666, and the lower and upper confidence intervals are 851 and 482. So what that means is this range between 85 and 48, um, if I did 100 studies, if I did 100 studies like um, like this, sorry, 1,200 studies, if I did 1,200 studies and then did 100 meta-analyses, then 95% of these intervals will contain the real population mean. Now, we never know what the real population mean is, so we don't know if it's the real population mean could be less than 0.4, could be more than 0.48 or less than 0.85, don't know. But that's what the confidence interval tells you. And if you make if you make these plots in Excel, you'll realize it takes quite a long time. But um, this is a very nice forest plot. So you can uh, you can copy and paste that, I believe. If you so we've got our 12 studies. Um, each one comes with a, a symbol, a sample size, and standard error. You can see that the um the boxes are all about the same size um, because I don't think that's taken into account. And the, the error bars are also very similar because they're all studies of between 10 and 15 subjects. And then you can use, use this zero line here. You can look down and you can immediately tell that three of these studies produced a non-significant result. So studies one, two, and four, and then all the others produced an individually significant result. And then if you add all the studies together and weight them, get a, get a random effects weighted mean model, you get an overall effect size 0.67, and that's the same numbers as up, up there. So the forest plot is giving you exactly the same as this, but it's um, very pretty. And that could go straight into a publication. That's a really nice, a really nice um, plot. Uh, let's have a look at the funnel plot. It's gonna be pretty boring, I think, because so because it's all from my lab and we basically did the same thing 12 times with slight, slight variations, you'll see that the, um, the funnel plot is not very helpful because all the studies have about the same standard error because they all have about the same uh, sample size. So. There's not much to learn from this funnel plot. Yeah, so we don't, in this case, we don't learn anything really about, um, although let's see if I have publication bias. <laughs> given that given that only some of these are published, there shouldn't, there shouldn't actually be any publication bias. Um, but we can click those, click those buttons and then go back up. It's running an algorithm to test for publication asymmetry funnel plot. Okay, so it's produced, uh, there's a rank test and a regression test. These are two commonly used tests for funnel plot asymmetry to try and estimate publication bias. They're both not significant, which is good. I didn't fix this, by the way. This is a real example that um, someone asked me on, on Twitter to produce this, and I did, and then I was very happy with the results. So there's no evidence for publication bias in my data, probably because uh, half of it's not published anyway. So I know, I know all of the data. This is all of them, only some of them are published in any case. But let's do a trim and fill analysis so you can go into the diagnostics box it will then run this algorithm looking for missing studies and it will tell me if I've missed any studies, which would be amazing because I, here we go. So there's the trim and fill analysis. I think these are the um, statistics I don't quite understand, but let's just look at this one. So this, this plot is telling me that there's one study which I don't know about. It was done in my lab um, and I, it's been suppressed and I don't know about it. So, I mean, it's good that there's only one. It suggests the algorithm is sort of working, but um, I know for sure that that's, that's not real because I've done all of these studies and there are none that are miss missing at the moment. But that's how, how it potentially could be could be used if you could you could meta-analyze the data and try and guess how many studies have been missed from the literature. Ah, uh, God, there's a few more boxes to tick. So we're just gonna tick all of them. 
let's just do one. I think I don't know what these other things are. Let's do this one. Fail safe n. Yeah. So this this analysis from Rosenthal is saying I would need to add 260 studies to this plot, all with zero effect. So if I added 260 studies on the on the dotted line, that would turn my actual p-value into a a non-significant p-value. So that, I mean, it's just a number. It just helps you to it helps you to work out how different from zero is my effect, if you like. I would need to do 260 studies with with zero effect, and to hide them, to make these studies look obviously selected and obviously biased. I think that's so. It's very unlikely that there are 260 missing studies. Yeah, and I was reading something the other day which said it's not it's not very realistic. Um, it's all it's just assuming that there are 260 studies exactly on zero. There's only one study there that's exactly on zero, so it's it's an unlikely sort of thing. But it's a number you can use. And these things are are reported. These three things: Kendall's tau, Eggers' say, and Rosenthal's fail safe n. You can also do other stuff. So if you have um, if you had some factorial design, so ten studies of one type, ten studies of another. I'm not sure how that works in the factorial. You can also add them in there. I've got a covariate, which is the type of study. So I've got three. There's three types of study here. I won't bore you with the details. There are just three types. Different parts of the body were being tested, and um, different experimental designs. So, and that's all encoded in the in the study label. So, if I add that into covariates, it's now going to redo the meta-analysis and using my my classification of the studies to um, stratify the data. So it's saying um, it's definitely changed the results. So overall, it's telling me before it was quite a strong overall effect. And now the overall effect is much weaker, but the model is still a significant model. So the, the information I've given it is, is still um, providing a significant explanation of the variability. But this is the new result that study type. So now I can say that these four, these four studies are different from each other. Sorry, these three groups of four studies are different from each other in some way. And I, I know what those differences are, and that's then my job to interpret them. But so in theory, you can do quite um, sophisticated analysis just in this JSP thing. And when you add the study type here, so now it's got the three groups of studies, one, two, and three, and it's got the, the sort of meta-analytic mean within each one, the gray diamonds in there. So it's got the estimates for those three types, and it's suggesting that the first type is the, the least effective, the second type is, is that effective, and the third type that effective. I don't really understand what it's doing there, so I'm just going to move on. So that essentially is it. We've come all the way um, to meta analysis. Hopefully, you now, rather than just click clicking the buttons, you know what's going on. You know that sample size, effect size, and and um, the standard error of the effect size are all being shown in here. Yeah. So there's that sample size. There's that study with six six subjects. It's in their tiny little box because it's not very happy about the size of that study. And you know how to interpret these forest plots because. You've got confidence intervals, effect sizes, and um, the null hypothesis, which is zero. Hopefully, you can now look at funnel plots with a new light, and you know what they mean.